Morning. It's great to see you all again. Okay, so um, about a month ago, I was here and preached a sermon titled Temple Concepts. And what we did in that sermon, in that study, is we just went through the Old Testament and looked at a bunch of places where we saw where God dwelled, where God's presence dwelled in a certain place, and we studied the characteristics of that place. One thing, the thing that we walked away with was, wherever God dwells, if people are going to be there, or if anything is going to be there, it's got to be holy. That was a consistent theme in every single place where God's presence was. It's got to be holy. We looked at Adam and Eve in the garden. As soon as they sinned, God's presence left them in the garden because God is holy and him is no darkness. He cannot dwell in the presence of sin. Moses, in order for him to approach the presence of God in the burning bush on Mount Sinai, he had to take his sandals off. That was the qualification because the ground was holy. After the Israelites fled Egypt, they came to God and they approached God at Mount Sinai and God gave them qualifications, conditions that had to be met in order for them to be in his presence. They had to consecrate themselves for three days. They had to be holy. The tabernacle had a yearly ceremony, the Day of Atonement, where they would purge the tabernacle with blood into the Holy of Holies once a year by the high priest. He had to cleanse himself. He had to offer sacrifice to the people. It was a yearly sanctification of the tabernacle the place where God dwelled with his people and tented with them as they moved about. We looked at the temple, same thing with the temple. Every single time, in order to be in God's presence, you've got to be holy. And we concluded, noting that if we want to be in God's presence, we have to be holy. And it seems like a daunting task in order to, how am I going to be holy enough to be in God's presence? I've got to be sanctified. We finished our study in the book of Hebrews. If you want to open, I'm going to start where we left off last time, in Hebrews chapter 10. You know, because I think it's an important, one one thing that I noted, part two of that lesson, I said was going to be that, um, well, when you realize you're a temple for God, it should elicit some behavioral response. It should make you want to behave differently. But I think it's an important distinction to be made that what you do is not what makes you holy. The works that you do, the life you try to pursue in righteousness, in keeping with God's commandments and, and, and trying to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit, which we're told to do, that is not what sanctifies you. It is not what saves you. It is a result of you realizing, oh my goodness, I'm a temple of God, therefore glorify your God, God in your body. But it is imperative that we do not get the order switched up. And I want to talk about that this morning. In Hebrews 10, that's where we finished last time. Uh, We looked at Hebrews 10.10, but at at the very beginning in verse 1 there, it says, For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. So the writer of Hebrews here is contrasting the old way of doing things and the new way. We wish to be perfect before God, because if we're going to be in his presence, we can have zero blemishes. We must be perfect. It's a task you can't accomplish on your own. And it's a task, actually, that the offerings of bulls and goats couldn't accomplish. And that's what he's saying here. They could not be made perfect by these yearly sacrifices. But the answer comes in verse 10, by this will, the new will, the new covenant, that's introduced in verse 9, we will have been sanctified. That's what we wish to be, right? Sanctification is to make something holy. We want to be holy. You have been sanctified through what? The offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. He continues, every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins, but he, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool for his feet, that is, quoting some Old Testament passages, making obvious to the people who were familiar with those scriptures that he fulfilled that prophecy. For by one offering he has perfected, there it is, He has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. Now you see, what is considered synonymous with each other is sanctification and perfection. To be made holy is to be made perfect. To be cleansed of your sins is to be such that you you have met the conditions to be with God. That's what we want to get to. 
Okay, so before going on to what type of behavior, behavior should we adopt, how should we act as Christians, before going on to that, I want to make it incredibly clear that the way we behave is not what saves us. And if left unchecked, if we adopt that mindset, we run the risk of thinking of ourselves too highly as we ought to. So I'm going to spend some time looking at that today. If you flip back also to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we went here last time. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. It says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you have been bought with a price? Therefore... Glorify God in your body. We mentioned that last time. Now, what does it mean to glorify God in your body? What does that mean? Well, it, does it have anything to do with the way you behave, the things that you do to glorify? Yes, it does. What you do with this, right here he's talking in this context, he's talking about sexual immorality. So yes, what you do with your body matters. But the order is the point of this lesson this morning. You are a temple of God. You have been sanctified. Therefore, act like it. Glorify God in your body. It is not the other way around. He does not say, glorify God in your body. Behave a certain way. And in so doing, you'll earn your way to heaven. The order is imperative that we get it right. We see this elsewhere also in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Uh, it says, you know, therefore, present your bodies a holy an acceptable sacrifice to God. Don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by renewing your mind, right? We're familiar with that passage. Again, present your bodies a holy and living sacrifice. That is to uh, exhibit certain behaviors. But notice in both instances, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and in Romans 12, what's the word that prefaces both of those commandments, those instructions, is therefore, right? It's prefaced on something. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it was prefaced on, don't you realize you're a temple of God? Don't you realize that? So behave a certain way. And in Romans 12, it says, therefore, present your bodies a living sacrifice. In order to understand what Paul is trying to get across in Romans 12, we got to read the rest of the book, the first part. Okay, one through chapters 1 through, through 11. The order is important here. Um, here's the main point of the lesson. We wish to be holy, to be in God's presence. We are not holy because we act holy. Now, Jesus taught a radical teaching. He taught us to do things that the world, it doesn't seem right to the world, right? Put others above yourself. Treat others better than yourself. Love your enemies. That's a radical teaching. And we should try to do those things, right? Of course we should. What I'm trying to get at is that as Christians, we understand we should be set apart from the world in the way that we act. But do not confuse and do not think that by doing that, you're saving yourself. That's the wrong attitude. We don't earn our way to heaven. And I think it's really important to, to make that clear. <clears throat> when we see um, talk and passages dealing with sanctification, we can understand that that is synonymous with words and passages like salvation. And redemption, okay? They're this. Same. Six, verse 11. It says there, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. All different sides of the same coin. Sanctification, to be sanctified in order to be holy so that we can be in his presence eternally in heaven. Isn't that the goal? Yes, of course. That is salvation. That is to be saved from the punishment that is due us for our sins. That is to be cleansed of our sins, that we might be a holy and set-apart people. That is to be justified, considered innocent. Although we are guilty in God's eyes, we are righteous. We are considered innocent. All of those things are the same. Also, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. But by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Sanctification is redemption. To be redeemed is to be sanctified, okay? Being with God. So consider this following question. If you think about Judgment Day in terms of a 
a human court, like a civil court. You'll stand before the judge one day, and you will present your case before the judge and the jury. And consider what evidence would you present in order to declare yourself and demonstrate yourself innocent. We want to be declared not guilty, right? What is your evidence? If you get up there and you start to present your case and you say, well, look what I did on August 17, 2017. Look at the charitable donations I made. Look at the times when uh, other people behaved in a certain way and I didn't. If your mind goes to that, wrong attitude. Wrong attitude. When we are ready to declare ourselves innocent and we say, okay, present your evidence, one thing, Jesus. That's it. That's where our mind goes to. Paul said, I would boast in nothing save in the cross of Christ. I come to you to present, and I would claim to know nothing. I, will, I won't boast in anything that I've done. I know one thing. Jesus died for me. He was perfect. That's it. I have faith in him, and I will put all of my trust there. I will rely nothing on myself. And I'm trying to harp on this because when we studied last time, we've got to be holy it makes it feel like I've got to behave a certain way. And you, we should. We should pursue kindness, love, joy, peace, right? The fruit of the Spirit. We, we are instructed in that. But let us not confuse that that is what saves us. It is not. That is the result of realizing we have been saved. Be slaves no longer to the flesh. Be slaves of righteousness, it says in Romans. This is the point of, of the lesson this morning. It's important that we get it right. So ultimately, this becomes a study of a well-known concept that's hit on several times in the Bible, and it's this. Justification of works versus justification by faith. Okay? Two contrasting ways by which a person might justify themselves. In, order, in other words, uh, two contrasting ways in which a person might present themselves innocent to a judge. How would you justify yourself? Faith or works? One is doomed to fail every single time, and the other one is not, because it's based on, well, faith in Christ. Okay, so this is going to be, we're going to look at this this morning. Um, and there's a couple of places where you might think to go, right? I mean, it's hit on several times in the Bible. Uh, things that, I mean, the whole book of Galatians nearly is focused on this point because those people were uh, potentially falling back into, you know, they were being preached perhaps to, uh, by the Judaizers who were trying to tell them, you've got to be circumcised, you've got to observe these ceremonies, etc. Um, you've got to you know, observe these, these certain things. And Paul is saying, no, 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 we, we don't abide, we are not held to that law anymore. The law is not what justifies us. We are not justified on a basis of law. We are justified by faith. It's a different way of doing things. The law served its purpose. It was a tutor to lead us to Christ. But now we have faith in Christ. That was the mystery that was to be revealed and has now been manifested, that was witnessed by the scriptures, it says in Romans. That all the prophets spoke to, and, and, but they didn't understand what it was, and now here it is. Righteousness is for who? Just Jews? No. Jews and Gentiles. That's the mystery that was revealed uh, in these times. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to look at Romans. To consider this. The first three chapters of Romans, if you want to open to Romans chapter one, that's where we'll start. You know, and as I was preparing this lesson, I was like, what I need to do is just read Romans chapter one through nine, <laughs> Romans one through 10. Um, but I don't know, you can do that on your own. I encourage you to do that. Go home and do that. But what, what's been really helpful for me in this study uh, was this book by Robert Turner, uh, his nephew, actually, we worshipped with his nephew at, uh, in Vermont, and we studied this book when we studied Romans. It's really simple. It basically is just Romans, but ever so often he sort of uh, has a little elaboration on certain points in there. Um, but it really helped me, especially in driving this point home, okay? Justification by faith, not by works. So Romans chapter 1 starts off with an introduction, as Paul usually does. He that introduction is verses 1 through 17. He concludes that introduction with the entire theme of Romans. And that is in verses, um, well, 16 and 17 in Romans chapter 1. Here's what it says. Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, 
For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Okay, so Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Some people might have thought he would have been. Look at his life prior to his becoming a Christian. He, crucif he uh, persecuted Christians. And Paul, is, Paul took a 180 degree turn, and he's saying, what I'm professing now, I am not ashamed in the least bit. I'll tell anyone about it. I'll preach it boldly. Not ashamed of the gospel, and it calls the gospel there the power of God. Now, I do mechanical engineering, and in mechanical systems, power is a term we frequently you know, consider with machines and systems. The power, the energy that is consumed per unit time. What do you think of a power? What is the power of a truck? The power of the sun, right? How powerful is God? Consider that question. What does it call the power of God here? It is the gospel. The, it says, uh, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God to salvation. The, the point there is, never undermine how powerful the gospel is. It might seem that people don't want to hear what Jesus has to say anymore. They can live their lives without Jesus. Don't undermine the power of the gospel. It is still a powerful message today, and there's many people who need to hear it. So let's tell them about it. It says in verse 17, In it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. There, righteousness is not speaking of an attribute of God. For sure, God is righteous. But here it's talking about the plan that God had for man to be righteous. Okay, For in it, in the gospel, God's plan to make man righteousness, righteous has been revealed from faith to faith. Now, revealed suggest that it was previously hidden. This is what I was talking about previously. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 6 elaborates on this a little bit more. This is Ephesians 3, verse 4. By referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations, past generations, was not made known to the sons of men. It has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific... This is Ephesians 3.6. To be specific, here's the mystery, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. The mystery's been revealed. Righteousness is not only for the Jews, it's for everyone and through faith. And that's what it says there. From faith to faith. That just means it starts with faith and it ends with faith. In all ways, man shall be righteous according to God's plan that has been revealed. Now, how? In all ways, faith. Never lose your faith. That is what saves us ultimately. That's the introduction. What then happens from Romans chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 18. Okay, All of chapter 2, the rest of 1 here, and the first 18 verses of chapter 3, Paul describes three sort of classes of people, groups of people, and all he will demonstrate that all of them are justly condemned. All of them are sinners and helpless. Okay? So here's the three groups of people. One is the, this is how uh, Robert Turner uh, sort of divides it, and I think it is helpful. One is the humanistic Gentile. The other is the moralistic Gentile. And the other is the Jew. So in chapter 1, verse 18, through the end of chapter 1, that sort of condemns the humanistic Gentile. In verse 18, it says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Now, how can you act in accordance with truth unless you know the truth, right? These were Gentiles. Were they given the law of Moses? No. So how can they know truth unless it's revealed to them? Well, continue reading. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. Even those Gentiles? Yes, for God made it evident to them. How? How can you know about God? It continues in verse 20. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. All men are without excuse because 
there is, we, we can see God's creation and understand His divine nature and His necessity of being there in order to bring these things. about more with the moralistic Gentile but here with the humanistic Gentile these are people who have totally ignored those instinctive impulses it's evident God is evident right that's what it says God is evident but they have totally ignored those things and they are pursuing with zero regret their degrading passions is what it calls it in verse 26 for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions and it describes some of the the things that they do, verse 29, they're filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, all these things. And they just pursue it. And they are justly condemned, is Paul's point here. But then it continues in chapter 2, where it starts to talk about the moralistic Gentile. It says, therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. There were apparently some Gentiles who would pass judgment on those other people who didn't live according to any moral standard. But what he's going to demonstrate here is even if you understand through your conscience that there is such thing as right and wrong, and you still, even if you understand that and you judge another person, you too sin, you also violate your conscience. You also understand there to be right and wrong instinctively, and you don't always uphold it, is, is going to be his point. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Um, I want to spend some time on chapter 2, verses 12 through 14. So let's read this here. It says, For all who have sinned without the law, and here's a, let's see, let me just go ahead and say this up front. You'll probably, in this, ver in this passage here, you'll see a bunch of the law, the law, the law, the law. There's a footnote, probably, in your Bible that'll say, or without law, without the the. Okay, so when it says the law, it's making reference to the law of Moses, the law that was given specifically on Mount Sinai, that is Torah. That's the law. But also law in general, like a principle of law applied to some people who did not have um, the Ten Commandments even, right? But they understood it's wrong to steal, it's wrong to kill somebody, it's wrong to murder, it's wrong to cheat. They understood that instinctively. It's like this... Well, we were made in the image of God, right? There's this universal moral code that these people understood. It says later that they were a law unto themselves, even though they didn't have the law. And therefore, they lived according to a law. Not the law, not the law of Moses, but a law. They thought that they could justify themselves on a principle of law. Like, in general, a law basis. Justification comes how? By not violating what I know to be wrong. That's the point. Even though they didn't have the law of Moses, they understood there was something that was right and wrong. And they thought, I can justify myself if I don't do what's wrong and if I do do what's right. That's the point. Let's read it. Verse 12. For all who have sinned without law will also perish without law. And all who have sinned under law will be judged by law. For it is not the hearers of law who are just before God, but the doers of law will be justified. What he's saying is that if you will live according to a law basis, according to a principle of law, if you seek to justify yourself on that basis, you've got to uphold everything. You have to be perfect if that's going to be the way that you're going to attempt to justify yourself. He continues, For when Gentiles who do not have law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, bearing witness in their thoughts, alternately accusing or defending them. And so, even though, this is the point here, even though there are some, not all people were given the Ten Commandments, that was to the nation of Israel. And there were people living elsewhere, right? But they, and everyone else, understood a universal like right and wrong, and they violated that code. That's the point that it's saying here. What Paul is building up to is everyone has sinned. Even non-Jews, even people who didn't have the law, everyone is justly condemned according to their sin. Verse 17 through the rest of the chapter then deals with Jews. He sort of speaks in verse 17 through 21 with irony in his voice. Here's what he says. But if you bear the name Jew and you rely upon law and boast in God, 
You know His will. You approve things that are essential, being instructed out of the law. You're confident that yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one should not steal, do you steal? You who say that you should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who have ore hiles, do you rob temples? You who boast in law, in other words, you who seek to be justified on the basis of law, that is, by keeping the law and being perfect, do you break the law? Do you not dishonor God? Here he's saying yes. The, the, um, re- it's a rhetorical question. The answer is yes. You have violated all of those precepts because no one is perfect. Verse 28 concludes, well, he says later, um, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Right? Your, your fleshly separation in, in your circumcision has become uncircumcision when you don't uphold the law. He continues in verse 28, for he is not a Jew. Jew means one of Judah, and Judah means praise his God. That was uh, where he got his name from uh, Leah when he was born back in Genesis twenty nine thirty five. For he is not a Jew. He is not one who truly praises God, who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew, that is one who praises God, who is one inwardly. Circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. Um, The first 18 verses of chapter 3 then deal with what Paul does in the whole letter of Romans, is he he makes a point, and then there's, there's sometimes this natural question that people would be begging to ask, and he goes ahead and answers it. And we'll see some of that coming up later. One of them here is this. It's like, well, wait a minute. Hold on. You just condemned all Jews because we're not perfect? Yes. But isn't there, like, isn't there something special about Jews? I mean, God picked the nation of Israel. And Paul says, yeah. I mean, the prophets that we have that prophesied about Jesus coming, that was through the nation of Israel. He says in, in verse 2, great in every respect is the advantage of the Jew. Why? They were entrusted with the oracles of God. That's to be praised, right? It's a good thing that we had the nation of people and prophets that wrote about Jesus coming so that it it would all be connected and make sense for us looking back in hindsight. But the next question after that is, well, so are we better than the Gentiles? And he asked that question in verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. And here's the summation. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Okay? That is the point of the first verse 118 all the way through through 18. And he goes on to quote um, a passage there from Psalms. We can read it ver- starting in verse 10. There is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There's none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. To the, together they've become useless. There's none who does good, not even one. And it continues. That's the first point. So Paul demonstrates in a succinct fashion, but in very clear, that everyone is justly condemned. Everyone's helpless. If you seek to justify yourself on the basis of law, you're doomed to fail because everyone has sinned. And now you sit there and you go, well, great. How can I be justified? What evidence am I going to show to the judge and the jury that I'm innocent? How do I have any hope of going to heaven? And this is going to be, uh, well, he's going to demonstrate that it's through faith in a number of different ways all the way through chapter 10. And then he'll say, or through chapter 11, and then he'll say, now that you realize this, present your body as a living sacrifice. I'm only going to look at uh, what was our scripture reading this morning, verses 19 through 28, and then the lesson will be yours. So let's read that again. We've just demonstrated everyone is guilty of sin, and therefore anyone who seeks to justify themselves on on the basis of law is doomed to fail, and we are totally without hope. Enter faith. That's how we'll be justified, starting in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be closed. What we're going to see in a minute is that's talking about, remember we read at the end of the, of the scripture reading, where is boasting then? Like, how do I say with my mouth, look at my works and therefore justify myself? Where is boasting? It says it's excluded. That's what it's saying here. Every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of law, no flesh 
will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes knowledge of sin. Another summation. You can't save yourself by doing. You can't save yourself by good, doing good enough. That's not how this works. But now, continuing in verse 21, here's the new way of things. But now, apart from law, that is, apart from a justification on law basis, the righteousness of God has now been manifested. Again, that's the same righteousness that was in verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 17. God's plan for man to become righteousness has been manifested. It says it was witnessed by the law and the prophets. Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 elaborates on this. Let me read that. Okay, here's what it says. Um, in verse 21 there, the righteousness of God has been manifested and it was witnessed by the Old Testament, basically, is what it says there, by the law and the prophets. Galatians 3.8 says this, the scripture foreseeing, the scripture being the Old Testament, foreseeing, notice, uh, noting that it, it was witnessing something, it foreseed that God would justify the Gentiles, this is uh, Genesis 3.8, how? By faith. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham the believer. For as many as are of the works of the law, if you seek to justify yourself by law, it says, are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. That's what, if you want to justify yourself through law, that's what it requires. Abide by all things. Now, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident because the righteous shall live by faith, and it quotes Habakkuk there. However, the law is... ...is not of a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. In order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, that was the mystery that was revealed, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So back in Romans chapter 3, verse 21, where it talks about the righteousness of God, the plan that God had to make man righteous, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, they spoke about those things. And that mystery has now been revealed. It continues in, in verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, that is, it's saying, namely, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. This is the new way of doing things. In verse 21, it contrasts that with what? It says, apart from justification on a law basis. Now it's through faith for all those who believe. For there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the summation of what Paul had just said before. Romans 1.18 through 3.18. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, but now they're justified. How? As a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just, and notice what it says here, the justifier of those who has faith in Jesus. We talked previously about we want to be justified. How will I justify myself? What piece of evidence will I demonstrate to justify that I am innocent? It says it right there. He, he is the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. That's it. If you seek to justify by law, you're doomed to fail. Because you've got to abide by all things. And all have sinned, Romans 3.23. And everything leading up to that. So this opposes justification by law. A natural next question is, well, where is boasting? That's what it says in verse 27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. When it says what is boasting, what it's talking about is like where is, where is me pointing to what I do in order to demonstrate that I'm righteous? None of that. No more. It is excluded, he said. Where is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No. A law of faith. For we maintain, here's the summation of it, we're, we maintain a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. That's the message. Now, you know, there's this two-sided, it's like, it's like a thing that's tough to balance, I guess. Because you read that and you want to say, oh, so I don't have to steal? No. Paul is going to address all of those natural next questions. So you're saying behavior doesn't matter, right? Doesn't matter what I do? No. 
What, he asked that question several times. He says, so should I sin that grace may abound? No. Should I sin because I'm under grace and not under the law? No. Should I sin? Because, was the law sin? No. He addresses all of those questions going forward. And maybe next time we'll talk about that. But it is imperative that we do not confuse what we do as that which saves us. It is not. And that is Paul's point here. We rely solely on faith. Boasting is no more. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, Paul says, May it never be that I would boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I the world. All of us should seek to speak with the same language. Point to nothing that I've done. It is all through Jesus. I rely on nothing except for faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. The word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved. It's the power of God, the word of cross, the gospel. That's the power of God. We saw that earlier. And Paul concludes his, his, what he's going to say here at the end of 1 Corinthians 1 in verse 31 saying, Just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus and Him crucified. It's a simple message. I'm not saying that we don't seek to exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. Of course we do. But do not confuse that with that which saves you. It is not. Lest we lift ourselves up too high. We rely solely on, on faith in Jesus and His sacrifice. This morning, consider your relationship with God. Have you been sanctified? Where, where are you going if you died today? What are you relying on? If you've got questions about that, you can come forward and ask. You can wait until after services and ask someone if you don't know the answer to that question. If your answer is no, then you need to do something about it. You don't have to be perfect. No one can be perfect. But you can be sanctified through the death of the body of Christ, and then you can seek to glorify God in your body and exhibit the fruits of the Spirit. Let's sing our song.